Hello, I'm Vaughn Benner, and we are continuing the uh, series. In fact, this is the last installment on the series on the Feast of the Lord. So I'm so glad that you came uh, to be with us as we are here at First Baptist Church in Bryson City, wrapping up this, this lengthening series on the Feast of the Lord as they're taken from Leviticus 23. So uh, this one is a... Uh, they're all important one, but this one has a lot to say about who Jesus is, and, and Jesus used the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles to make several points that aren't always clear to those of us, especially Gentile types, who are looking at Scripture without understanding the background in the, in the Old Testament. So uh, that means we're, as usual, going to be going back and forth between the Gospels and, and, these, and the Old, Old Testament literature, so uh, bear with me on that one. Uh, but it also means that we're going to have to uh, truly be uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit to see the connections and understand what Jesus is saying about himself. So if you would, let's go to our Lord in prayer. Gracious God, our, our Heavenly Father, we praise you for being our Father, our Lord, our Redeemer, and King. We pray that you would fill us with your spirit as we go into your word, that we would see you high and holy and lifted up and understand what it means that Jesus is Lord according to the scriptures. Help us hear your own word that you've given us, not that we just read things off of a page, that we will see you and specifically we'll see Jesus our crucified and risen Lord, radiating from the word that you've given us. We pray for your wisdom and grace, and we thank you for your, the blessings that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the passage that we're coming from is Leviticus 23, as all the other feasts. They are, uh, they are given, they're sort of summed up, not necessarily a lot of detail in Leviticus 23, but but. Um, God had Moses sort of pull all the seven feasts together in this one chapter in such a way that you see the chronology of when they take place during the year. There are lots of other passages uh, uh, that give details about sacrifices that happen, but the chronology is here, and that's where I'm going to start. I'm going to be reading from Leviticus 23, beginning in verse 33, and I'll drop off at verse 36 because Moses takes sort of a, a little cul-de-sac where he sums up some other things. And we'll come back to the other verses in a few minutes. Verse 33. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, for seven days, is the Feast of Booths. Your Bible may say Feast of Tabernacles. It's the same thing. I'll come back to that word later is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. And for seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall not do any ordinary work. Um, as I read this passage, some of this should sound familiar if you've been keeping up with the previous installments of this. Um, these days, these holy days, are usually uh, given uh, something that looks like a Sabbath. There's, there, people are told not to do any ordinary work, at least on one of the days when, when you've got a whole week's worth like this one. So the first thing I want you to notice is that it says that seventh, seven days is this feast, but then there's a special day at the end of it an extra day, day, day number eight. And it says, on the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present food offerings to the Lord. So in a way, it's a continuation. So it's seven, and then a special day added on the end. And the first day and the last day are Sabbaths. In other words, you don't do any, anything, uh, you don't do any ordinary work. And one of the things that we see consistently through it is that there are food offerings through the whole time. Notice it doesn't say anything about sin offerings. It doesn't say anything about guilt offerings. Everything for this eight-day period is food offerings. Well, the time of year helps a little bit on that one. I'm going to put it back up here. Um, if you've been keeping up with this, 
you'll know that we are now in the month of Tishri, which is the seventh month in the, uh, in the Hebrew calendar, which is corresponding somewhere with late September, early October. Um, by this point in the year, all the harvest is brought in. So that'll tell you just by the calendar that this is going to be a lot of celebration time because the harvest is done. It's time to kick back, relax, and enjoy the fruits of your labors. And that makes sense when you've got God telling them for seven days you're going to hold food offerings because they've just made a harvest, so they've got lots of fresh food, and then a special food offering on the day eight. So it makes sense that this is going to be a time of celebration and enjoying all the good stuff that God's been giving them over the year. Um, there is more than that, of course, uh, as we get into uh, what is celebrated on Sukkot, which is, by the way, the Hebrew word for tabernacle. In Deuteronomy 16, verse 14, it tells us not just this is not just a celebration for Israel. Deuteronomy 16:14 are just not just the wealthy people in Israel who've got a, all the profits and of uh, being able to show what they've they've gotten over the over the course of the year, but in Deuteronomy 16, verse 14, it says doesn't sound like it's talking about the same thing at first. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles. And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing your God has give, that he's given to you. So the first thing we see in this one is that it is... Um, it's one of the convocations. It's where everybody, specifically the men of Israel, but really everybody, all the families of Israel are supposed to come to the temple three times. One at unleavened bread, which is tied with Passover. One at the Feast of Weeks, also known as Pentecost, 50 days after that. And then in the fall, those are spring, and then in the fall you've got this one. Everybody's supposed to come. And it's not just, as it says, your males shall appear before the Lord, but if you go back a little bit, to verse 13, I really should put up here, 13 and following verses. It says, You shall keep the Feast of Booths for seven days, when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and wine press, and you shall rejoice in your feast, you, your son, your daughter, then it gets a little bit bigger, your male servant and your female servants, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. In other words, everybody. Everybody is supposed to be celebrating the Feast of Booths. It is really a time of rejoicing and celebration. And I want to put a little thing in here. Notice that it's inviting the sojourner. Those are foreigners who have agreed to abide by the laws of Israel, uh, whether they are just passing through or whether they are coming to live there. This is a big celebration for everybody in the country. It's very inclusive. That The fact that it's for the sojourner and other people who are not actually Hebrew is very important to see later on. We're going to see this get a, become a very big deal later in Scripture. Um, that passage in Deuteronomy really tells you that, it's, that, that it is... Uh, a harvest celebration as much as anything. You're going to gather in the produce, and then you're going to celebrate. Now, the word tabernacle, fancy words, a big, Hebrew, a big uh, uh, Latin word, actually, and it simply means tent. It's a long word for tent. You'll remember in the Old Testament, uh, Moses has to ha have a tabernacle built, and they're going to put the Ark of the Covenant in it. Okay, that's a fancy way of saying they're going to take the Ark of the Covenant and they're going to build a big tent and put it inside. So whenever you hear the word tabernacle, or occasionally in some Bibles it'll say booths, what it really means is it's a tent. Might be a little tent, might be a big tent. It's a tent. And it has two forms, both a noun word just describing the tent and the verb word, which means to tent. Okay, all right, let's make that a little simpler. How about camp out? 
to dwell. You can get really formal. Oh, often when your Bible says, in the Old Testament it says, dwelling, that somebody is dwelling with somebody, and the word there is sukkot, which means they're hanging out together in a tent or around tents. They're camping out together. They're living together, but they're tents. Um, it recalls the traditional tent made of branches uh, that the workers would erect in the fields. Okay, picture this. Uh, you've got your harvest in the spring, and then you've got another harvest in the fall, and everybody has to rush out there and quickly get all of the stuff in before it goes bad, on, especially on the vines with the, with the grapes. And the workers would put up tents so they didn't have to go back and forth between town and the fields. So they would set up sukkot, a sukkot, a tent. Um, that way, no wasted time going back and forth. It also reminds Israel of the temporary shelters, the tents that they lived in for all those years that they were in the, in the wilderness wanderings in Exodus. So you can already see by God telling them that they're going to be celebrating using tents, it's reminding them of two things, the harvest and all the blessings that God has given us through the harvest, and also everything else that a harvest means, it's just full of metaphorical meanings and a remembrance of being back in the wilderness, living in tents, when God provided everything they needed and they were totally, miraculously dependent on his provision. So every year what would happen is, remember it's a command for a convocation, it's one of those three times a year so they got to go there. So you'd have all these families that would be converging on the temple and for about a half a mile of radius around the temple in Jerusalem, thousands of tents would be set up for all these people, all these pilgrims who are coming to the temple. And they would be living in all these tents, all within a half a mile or so of the temple. And they're all celebrating. There's a lot of partying going on. It's a very exciting time of year. And the Lord had specifically commanded that those seven days be celebrated, and I'm going to go back to Leviticus 23, the second part of that. And I'm hoping you're in with your Bible flipping back and forth like I'm doing right now. I'm going to read the second part. On the 15th day of that seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest. That's a Sabbath rest. You get there, chill out, rest. And on the eighth day is another day of solemn rest. And you shall take on that first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. So picture this. Just before the celebration, they can't do it on the Sabbath, the first day of it, so the, the week or so before uh, Tabernacles booth starts, everybody in Israel is out gathering branches. Whether it's willow branches, as it, mean, as it says in there, or palm fronds were very common. So you would have everybody gathering these branches together. Uh, it's something that kids would be, you know, mom and dad would say, oh, here, go out and get a bunch of palm fronds. We're going to have tabernacles. The Lord said they would celebrate with branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees, etc., etc. But notice the passage doesn't say exactly how they're used, supposed to use these, all these branches and, and palm fronds. So there was a lot of back and forth over the, over the centuries. They used them in all sorts of ways, waving them around, building the tents we're talking about. It seems to have been both. In fact, during the intertestamental period, that's the period between Malachi and Matthew, somewhere around 165, there was a big conflict. That was when the Sadducees and the Pharisees were really getting to become big theological and political parties. And the Sadducees who really only trusted the writings of Moses, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. They didn't like anything that was added to it. So they, they're conservative in that respect. They really like just what Moses wrote. And since this passage talks about those immediate and context of tabernacles, they said, oh, obviously God means build tents out of branches. 
And the Pharisees were a little more open with this, and they were also, you know, don't get the Pharisees wrong. They were really big into celebration, too. Um, people get this idea that there were a bunch of uptight guys walking around, you know, selling don't do this, don't do that. It's not quite, this, not quite the real picture. They were reading from the prophets, and they see lots of celebration with tabernacles. So they want people out waving around and, and praising God for all of his blessings. So uh, eventually they compromise by doing both of them, which makes sense. Um, while I'm at talking about controversies, I'm also going to bring out another controversy. The timing of year is important. The harvest has just come in, and the rainy season is about to start. Well, for most of us living in the Western world, especially in the United States, that's, that, that doesn't click as to why that's really important, unless you live in a desert area where the exact timing of the rain is really important. They've just had a long, dry, hot summer, and their ability to raise crops is completely dependent on when those late fall, winter rains kick in. So while they're celebrating this feast, they're also really looking forward to next year's harvest, which means, hey, the rains need to start in the next few days. So they're praying for rain. And so over the years, temple priests started adding that prayer formally, and they actually incorporated several passages of Scripture. Isaiah 12, 3. Verse 3, they incorporated this as part of the prayers that would go on from the temple during the Feast of Tabernacles, so called. And that verse says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So they're, they're tying together this idea of salvation tied to God's provision and rain. They're seeing the merging of those ideas of God giving us physical water but he also gives us spiritual water. Jesus makes a great deal of that, too. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. So the priests were adding this prayer uh, to the tabernacle services uh, there at the temple. Later on, after the Babylonian exile, during the writings of Ezra and Nehemiah, this becomes a big deal, a huge ritual. Um, because the people are, Nehemiah and, and Ezra are really teaching the people to be very biblically focused and very focused on the fact that God provides, not all these other gods and certainly not yourself. Um, and during that time, an elaborate ritual tied to this idea that God was a provider and using that verse from Isaiah, the high priest would go down to the pool of Siloam, which is right outside of the temple, and he'd take a picture, and he would walk back, and you can picture there's going to be a lot of crowd watching this. He would walk back up to the temple with this big picture of water through a particular gate of the temple, which is known as the water gate. So if you're ever reading Nehemiah 3.26, verse 13, if you ever, when you're reading Nehemiah, and you come up to that point, or any of the other passages after that, the word, the place comes up regularly. The water gate, well, it's called that because that's the gate closest to the Pool of Siloam where the, the high priest would be carrying this pitcher of water up to the temple, and he would go through the gate that's mentioned there in Nehemiah, hence the name water gate. He would carry that pitcher of water all the way up to the altar, going up all the steps, and with every step he went up the, up the temple steps, there would be singing and all sorts of things that are going on. We'll talk about that in a minute. But it's a big fanfare. And then he would get all the way up to the altar, and he would pour it out in one of the basins as a drink offering. Remember, uh, both Leviticus and Deuteronomy mentioned that there are food offerings. So this actually became part of that food offering. They would take the 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 bread offerings that they had in that, and they would take the wine offerings, and now they were adding a water offering. It made very much sense to them to do this. Well, a little historical note here on the side. In 95 B.C., uh, 
long after the times of, of the revolts with the Greeks and so forth, you've got the rise of the priest kings, the Hasmoneus and priest kings. They're not very biblical, and, but they are Sadducees, and they're stickler for the rules. And this one priest king named Alexander Janias actually, he really didn't want to do it, but the crowd was kind of forcing him. But rather than pouring the water into the basin, the sacrificial basin there at the altar, he poured it on the ground. Oh, this is an insult. And you can tell that a lot of people would probably not be happy with that. And they weren't. There was a riot. A lot of people died, possibly as many as 6,000. I mean, we're talking about a lot, a lot of hot-headed Jews in, a, in the midst of a lot of wars around them. Yeah, it was a bloody time. And the people forced Alexander and his successors to continue the popular right. By the way, if you, that name, I bring it up for a simple reason. To give you a little context, this guy's great-granddaughter was named Mary, Mary Amney, and she's the one who married Herod the Great and gave him some legitimacy to the Jewish throne. So we're talking that line of priest-kings. They're not really biblical priest-kings. They're not terribly popular, and they're the ones that eventually led to Herod the Great. All right, anyway, so the prayers for rain and the offering that, they're tied, that they use for that, they're not really out, off the wall. It really does make sense when you start putting it together. Uh, there's a lot of precedent all the way back to Moses' instructions. I get said back over here, I'm not going to read this passage. Moses is given a lot of laws about the sacrifices that are to take place in this feast. I'm not going to get into those in detail. Um, the whole sacrificial system is a little bit outside the purview of this lesson. But I do want to bring out that in Numbers 28, just before that, uh, Numbers 28, and I believe it's verse 7, 28, verse 7, as getting up to the sacrifice, it mentions that there will be drink offerings that the priest would pour out a quarter of a hen for each lamb, a drink offering of strong drink. In other words, they were to take wine and pour it into this basin that we were just talking about. So since there's already a drink offering going on, it really is logical for them to start doing the water as well. Um, now, I've already pointed out that tabernacles is just the rendering of the Hebrew sukkot. Um, and just means tents or booths. You'll see both. It also has another nickname in the scriptures called the Feast of the Ingathering. And there's a double entendre with this one as well. Because on the one hand, it's the obvious. It's right at the end of the last harvest of the year. They've been gathering in all the harvest. Well, that word in, in gathering starts taking on another, member, another meaning as you go through Scripture, especially in the prophets, where it's not just talking about the, the, the harvest of, of grain and, and, and grapes and such. It's also talking about the end time harvest when God is drawing all of his people together. So you have not only a harvest mentality of food, a harvest mentality of people at the great convocation, the great gathering at the end of time as we know it right now. Um, we see it named the Feast of the End Gathering. I'm going to put up these. I'll get rid of this shishi comment right here. As early as, as uh, Moses' own writing, we see it in Exodus 20. 3.16 and 34.22. We also see it, well, I'm going to get to the next ones in a minute. Um, we see something else happening on this Feast of the End Gathering. In Second Chronicles, Solomon chooses or works out that Solomon is dedicating the temple the very first temple when Solomon's built the beautiful temple in 2 Chronicles 5.3. 5, uh, 5, 
three. And he's doing this, dedicating the temple at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, Booths, the Feast of the Ingathering. I'm going to turn there just for a moment. Second Chronicles 5.3. Don't want that pin to roll off. It's a time of big celebration. And in fact, I'm going to back up just a little bit. Picture this. Solomon has got the temple built. He's going to have this big celebration. And it would make sense that he's going to be celebrating and dedicating the temple at the time when people are going to be coming to Jerusalem anyway or coming to that area. Remember that God told them there would be three convocations where they were all supposed to come to the Ark of the Covenant and celebrate. Well... Solomon has picked the most joyful of those tabernacles to do the dedication. So I'm going to back up to verse 2. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Okay, so... All these people are going to be coming to wherever the ark is anyway, and Solomon's going, oh, this makes sense. We're going to bring everybody together for this celebration. Verse 3, And all the men of Israel assembled before the king at the feast that is in the seventh month. That's Tishri, and the feast that's in then is, the, is this feast. And all the elders of Israel came, and the Levites took up the ark. So you can see he's intentionally using this idea of the Feast of Ingathering to gather all these people together. Um, and we'll go for a little bit more into what happens at that in just a minute, but I want to, want to set the case. So you've got all these people that are gathering, so it's using the, the name Ingathering. Feast of the Ingathering. So Solomon's making a, a big deal of it, not just gathering the crops, but gathering people. And then something amazing happens. A few verses later in Second Chronicles 5, verses 13 and 14, Solomon prays over the temple. And then in verse 13, we see, let me turn to it. And Solomon had a bronze platform five cubits long, five cubits wide, three cubits high. He set it in the court, and he stood on it. Then he knelt on his knees in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel, there's no God like you in heaven or earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to all your servants who walk before you with all their heart. And then he goes on with this prayer. He mentions the fact that God, who cannot be confined in one place, has chosen to dwell with them. Verse 18, but will God indeed dwell with man? Remember, that's the word tent. Will he come and tent with us, camp out with us? Will he dwell with man on the earth? Behold, heaven, the highest heaven can't contain you. How much this house that I've built? Yet have regard to the prayer of your servant. O oh Lord, my God. And then he goes on with his prayer, and something remarkable happens. The Shekinah glory. Hmm? Well, with six. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I'd skip forward into Second Chronicles uh, chapter 6 by that point with verse 12. Uh, you know, and, and we see we go forward to chapter 7. As soon as Solomon prayed, by the way, it's all these three chapters are together. I apologize. As soon as Solomon finished his prayer at the beginning of chapter 7, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings, the sacrifices, and the Lord God filled the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests couldn't even enter the house of the Lord because of the glory of the God, uh, of God filling the Lord's house. And when all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord in the temple, they bowed their, down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshipped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. By the way, that is Second Chronicles 
7, verse 3. Now, they're doing this spontaneously out of worship and adoration to God. But what they're reading from, they're remembering this Psalm 118, where that verse is repeated over and over again. It's sort of like a, uh, uh, for those of you who remember what uh, responsive readings are like in old-fashioned old churches, this was sort of a responsive reading uh, out of the Psalms during Passover. So they're taking a Passover psalm and applying it to now spontaneously worshiping God. And it's going to become very important that that quote gets used over and over and over again. Now, it doesn't take a big leap to realize that this in-gathering really is going to be all about, ultimately, about God gathering all of his people together at the end. Um, the tabernacle and then the temple are both where God would dwell. Literally, it says tabernacle, tent, hang out with people. Uh, the Shekinah glory not only provides a graphic picture, I mean, can you imagine being there and God's pouring his glory out that, boy, this becomes very remember very memorable and something to hang on to. Later generations would have heard their parents and grandparents and great-grandparents talking about it and it becomes this big thing that it, people remember of God's glory coming down on the temple during that time. Um, I will write out a list of passages. We have Habakkuk 2.14 Habakkuk 2.14 is a really good one um, where it says, The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters covering the sea, remembering that the temple was filled, and this becomes a picture of God filling not just the temple, but the entire earth, and ultimately coming to live with us. Uh, we see similar Psalm 57, um, verses 5 through 11. Oops. Five through eleven. Um, Psalm seventy nine, nineteen. Isaiah six three. Remember Isaiah appears on. Well, he he talks about that. Isaiah six three. These are some some big ones, and I'm not going to give them all. My goodness, we would be here for hours if I gave you a list of all. All the world will someday participate in the gathering of nations. Revelation 7, 9 explicitly is talking about that when it says, there will come from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages, and they will stand before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. That's Revelation 7, 9. If you don't see the link between the Feast of Tabernacles and this final in-gathering when God gathers all the tribes, all the tongues, all the nations together, he has gathered his church, his redeemed, from the, all the ages, from all the places together. And they will praise the Lord and they will do so, as it says, with palm branches. This is the Feast of Tabernacles. This is where the Feast of Tabernacles is really going, looking for that final, ultimate gathering after Yom Kippur has cleansed the church of its sin and removed sin forever from, it, from its people, its members, and now they can, in shining raiment with glowing faces and completely undivided hearts, worship God and wave their palm, palm, palm fronds. You can't miss the connection. But there's more about Sukkot, the Feast of, Temple, the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm going to go ahead and erase these in the hopes that you've already written them down. That passage in 2 Chronicles where the Shekinah glory 
shines down and, and fills up the temple also brings another imagery. We've talked about the imagery of water. With the, We're looking forward to the, the rains and the blessing of God through the rains. But there's another one now, light. Light. The Shekinah glory shining down on and filling the temple actually becomes remembered through a ceremony later on. See, at the same time that the high priest is taking that pitcher of water up from the pool of Siloam, going up into the temple through the water gauge and up the steps, it's a really showy thing. The procession is slow and the Sanhedrin are dancing. Now, if you get a picture of the Sanhedrin from the New Testament, sometimes you think of them as a bunch of stodgy old guys. But no, they would be participating in this celebration. They would be dancing along with the high priest and the other and the Levites and so forth. They're all dancing all the way up to the temple. And they had special dances that they would do. Uh, we've got a lot of, 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 of uh, what they call midrash literature talking about how elaborate this was. And they had special dances. And the Sanhedrin would carry torches. Picture they and all of their entourage, and, all their, and they're all carrying torches going up in the evening as the priest is carrying this water up to the temple. And as they got to the temple, there were 15 steps up there, and they would sing a song, uh, one of the psalms of decree, of degree, Psalm 120 through 134. They would sing all these 15 songs. Each step, you'd have to stop. They would sing that whole psalm, waving their, their, their bright lights and their palm fronds, and then they, he'd go up another one, and they'd sing another song, and it would go on and on all the way up, all the way up the steps of the temple. Now, at the same time, remember, this is the middle of the month of Tishri, by definition. It's a lunar calendar. That means it's at the full moon. It's bright. The whole temple courtyard is flooded with the light of the full moon. And it, there are also, according to the old literature, there are huge menorahs. Think of them as big candelabras. that are four of them that are in the court of, of, of women, the outer court of the temple. When I say a, a menorah, I don't mean one of these little things that you may see you know, when you see pictures of what a Passover might look like. These things are huge. Um, we've got, there are paintings from, from the time period that show they're 75, 80 feet tall. They're massive. And they've got these, they're, they're like, they don't have candles at the top. they got bonfires. I mean, huge fires, four of them on top of each one of these. And there are four of them, a lot of light. So you got torches and candles and people waving and singing as they go up to the temple and then up the steps. And the place is flooded with moonlight and it's flooded with torchlight and it's flooded with the light from these huge menorahs. It's a lot of light. It's a lot of light. Um, and also, when they get up there, they finally get to the priest, gets to the top, and they, they read out with this responsive reading, Psalm 118, like they would have back at Passover. It's a really big spectacle. Now, that light becomes important. We see things like Ezekiel 43, 4 through 7. 43. Four through seven. Ezekiel sees this as a foretaste of the return of the Shekinah glory of God coming to live with his people. I'll quote this one. It's worth the long quote. As the glory of the God entered the temple by the gates facing east, the Spirit again lifted me up and brought me into the inner court. And behold, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. While a man, there was he had a, a spiritual guide going through this, so he's standing with him. I heard, while the man was standing beside me, I heard one speaking to me out of the temple, and he said to me, O oh, son of man, this is the place of my throne and the place of the soles of my feet where I will dwell in the midst of my people, of the people of Israel forever, and the house of Israel shall no more defile my name. Here you can see the product of the cleansing of Yom Kippur. Their sins have been taking, uh, taken away from them. They no longer don't even have the desire to defile God's name. And the image of God personally tenting, camping out, reigning on the earth 
living with his people. Isaiah, in one of the most beautifully poetic passages that Isaiah wrote, and he wrote a lot of beautiful ones, Isaiah 60, verse 19. My pen is getting a little dry here. That's Isaiah 60. One of my personal favorites. The sun will know thee no more your light by day, nor for brightness shall the moon give you light, but the Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your glory. Talking about that incredible spectacle of the priest and the Sanhedrin and the Levites and the people singing out and all these this huge amount of light in there. It's nothing, nothing compared to the light that God is going to bring when he comes to tent out with his people. Now, the, all this imagery with light and tabernacles and branches and palm fronds, by this point you should say, wait a minute, these images show up in the Gospels quite a bit, and they do, and most visibly at Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And uh, in Matthew, or excuse me, in Mark eleven eight, eight, and John twelve, verse thirteen, and other, uh, and and you can look in all the gospels. You'll see they're spreading leafy branches, or in John it says branches of palm trees in front of Jesus. They're paving the road in Jer and through Jerusalem with all these branches. It's where we get Palm Sunday. Oh, wait a minute. We've got a problem. We've got to, we'll come back to that in a minute. Their action has been inspired by the Feast of Tabernacles, and they rightly see Jesus as the Messiah who would bring about God's earthly reign. But there's a problem. The people at the time that they're celebrating Jesus coming in that triumphal entry, we call it, is actually just before Passover. And tabernacles, it's seven months later in Tishri. It's the wrong time of year. It's the right idea, but it's the wrong time. Jesus was going in Jerusalem not to take up his throne and reign as God on earth. He's actually going there to take up his cross and die as the Passover lamb. But they got it confused. They rightly seen the Messiah coming in, but they picked not only the wrong date, but they don't understand that this is that him coming to reign is going to take at least 2,000 more years. And he will come to reign. Not now. But they've got the right idea at the beginning of that. So to go from tabernacles to the triumphal entry, we just look at... We, we, we can see them making the mistake. First, they're crying out during that entry. Uh, um, in the verses right after that in Mark, it says, Blessed is he, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming of our father of the kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. Um, that's a paraphrase coming from uh, Psalm 118. Interesting, that Messianic psalm is both part of Passover and it's part of the Feast of Tabernacles, of Sukkot. So that song is already on their minds as they're getting ready for Passover, but the connection is also with tabernacles. Uh, here's another connection that would have gotten people a little confused that Jesus is starting that reign now, right now at that point. It's on the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles, in the context of all those drink offerings, that Jesus cries out in John 7, 37. He cries out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now, Jesus is saying this, if you read that passage, he's saying it from the temple. Well, at the... At the same time that Jesus is saying that, they've been watching, or they were getting ready to watch the high priest walk with his pitcher of water up to offer a drink offering, hoping, you know, looking forward to the, the rains, hoping that God would bless them, that they would have water to drink and raise their crops. And Jesus is saying, 
let them come to me and drink. He exceeds the authority of the high priest, and he's telling them that. The high priest is just going to pray for rain and offer a drink offering symbolic of his prayer. But Jesus is actually telling his people he exceeds the high priest. In John 7, 38, just the next verse, it says, Whoever believes me, as the scriptures read, out of his heart will flow water, or flow rivers of living water. We've already seen back in, in uh, John chapter 4, the, the woman at the well, talking about her physical need for water and her spiritual need. Well, here it is even more important. We go one verse later in John 7. He's saying that he is both the provider of physical water and the spiritual water because Jesus goes on to say, Now this he, Jesus, said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to yet to receive, for as yet the Holy Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Well, so we got water in there, but a few verses later, at the same celebration, mind you, all this is in the context of temples, a few verses later in John 8, verse 12, Jesus proclaims, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now, again, this is in context of the high priest taking that water up into the temple, but also all these hundreds of people with, with, with torches and candles and those big menorahs and so forth. Light is everywhere. And Jesus says, saying, no, I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me won't walk in darkness. And he's really talking about Isaiah 49, verse 60, where, he's, where Isaiah, speaking for God, says, I will make you as a light for the nations and my, that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So divine light plays a major role also in one other event that you start, should start thinking about, the transfiguration. When Jesus' face shone like the sun, his clothes as white as light, it's Matthew 17. Matthew 17. In verse 2 specifically. Uh, parallel to that is Mark 9, 3. Describing Jesus as radiant. Uh, and Jesus, picture Jesus, he's glowing with his radiance. And there's three disciples that are there, Peter, James, and John. And they, they fall at Jesus' feet. And Peter blurts out, Oh, if you wish, I will make three tents. And, of course, you talk about one for Jesus, one for Elijah, and one for Moses, who are all there at the transfiguration. It sounds kind of random. Until you put the Feast of Tabernacles with all the light and Jesus' glorification together. He's just got the date wrong and the location wrong, but he understands that that is tied together. It would be appropriate. If God is coming to live with his people, build a tent, have a tabernacle. Uh, for, um, among, not only that, but Moses' presence makes it look like the resurrection is starting up, the resurrection of the end. So, you know, we've got, you've got Moses coming back who's resurrected, and furthermore, we've got Elijah present. Elijah makes it look like God's personal herald, herald is about to come proclaim the Lord's return, Micah 4, 5. Micah 4, 5, where it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Together, these look to God coming to tabernacle with us in the, man of, in the person of Jesus Revelation, we say, behold, the dwelling place, the tabernacle of God is with man. You can see what, what Peter's thinking is. He's got it right. He's got the wrong time and the wrong place, but he's got the idea right. Now, as a little footnote, Zechariah, most of the book of Zechariah is about the Feast of Tabernacles and the great, great day of the Lord. And Zechariah mentions 
and 14.4. That's really supposed to be, it says, on that day the Lord's feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Well, the transfiguration takes place on, the Mount, on Mount Tabor, quite a ways away. Peter's got the right idea. He's got the wrong date and the wrong place. But it does show the intent of the Feast of Tabernacles. So, we have the Shekinah glory coming down on the temple when Solomon dedicates it and at other periods through the temple's history. But that was temporary. Jesus, as God incarnate, also lived with as one of us, living with his disciples, but even that was only for a time. You can argue that Jesus is always going to retain his human resurrected body, but he's not physically with us now. All these pictures of tabernacles, of God living with us in some way, are temporary. As with the other holy days, the other autumn holy days, we see that Jesus kind of fulfills it, but it's only a passing way. It's partial. So if Jesus fulfilled the spring holy days exactly on the day they occurred, we can look forward to him doing that in the future. Therefore, the Feast of Tabernacles, God living with us permanently and perfectly, is still prophetic. Looking for that time when Yom Kippur has cleansed us from our sin, and then God will, as he says in John 12, 32, he will, Jesus will draw all people to myself. <clears throat> Something that the people at the time didn't understand. They, they thought, we've heard the law that the Christ remains forever in John 12, it says. They get the idea, but they don't understand John 12 <coughs> Jesus goes on in 36, verse 36. He says, The light is among you only for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. The one in darkness doesn't know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. He's saying his ministry right then is just for a little while. But Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles looks forward to that time when God in Jesus will camp out with us forever. Revelation 21 sums it up beautifully. And I saw no temple in the city. This is Revelation 21 beginning in verse 22. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord, the God Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun and moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the lamp is the Lamb. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of light, life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. But we see those two big pictures of the light of God and the miraculous provision of water, both its physical sustenance and its spiritual necessity tied together in the Lamb at the end at that great and glorious future Feast of Tabernacles. God camping out with us forever. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly.